Hello, here are the answers to all your questions on my follow me to work video. Thanks to everyone that prayed for my safety. I am thankful to God for watching over me all these years that I've been doing this job. Then to the questions. I have a list here with me which I'll be reading. How does one get this kind of job? How did I get this kind of job? You get this kind of job by applying on the company's websites. I'll put the links to all the oil exploration companies that I know of in the description box below. Click show more under this video to see that. If you're in Nigeria, look for adverts in Tuesday Guardian. You will not see the names of these companies in these adverts, but look for such words like oil field services, oil industry, upstream petroleum, downstream petroleum. If you apply and you don't get a response, wait for six months and apply again. The oil industry is a seasonal industry and maybe they don't need people when you apply, but six months later they will need someone. For me, I got the job during my NYSC in Nigeria. Those from Nigeria know what I'm talking about. I was serving in River State and the Slumbeje recruiter came to our orientation camp to tell us about their company and the career opportunities that exist. They needed people with engineering degrees, any course with engineering in it, yeah, and um, physical sciences degrees, that's uh, physics, geophysics, geology, industrial chemistry. At the end of the talk, I submitted my CV with many others and we were invited for a written test, which I went for. Towards the end of my service year, one year later, I was invited for an interview. It was an all-encompassing interview. Oral, written, practical, team projects. It lasted for 10 good hours. And at the end of the day, I was hired and sent to the UK to work for Slumberger Western Jiko. Western Jiko is the oil exploration segment of Slumberger. I didn't choose Western Jiko. I actually wanted to work for Wireline, but today I'm happy that I was sent to Western Jiko because I don't think I'll be getting all the time off that I get now if I were in Wireline. What degree do you need? Usually the companies will put the degree requirements on their websites, you know, when they advertise for the jobs. If you're applying in Nigeria, you may be required to have an engineering degree, like I said earlier, a physical sciences degree. I find that my non-Nigerian colleagues, North Americans, Europeans, they don't need these degrees. Some of them have the equivalent of Nigeria's OND. Some of them were ex-military personnel. So if you have experience in the military, any part of military, army, air force, navy, Marine Corps, yeah, if you're interested in this job, go check out these websites. Maybe they need people like you. At the end of the day, a certificate is what it is. I have an electronic engineering degree, but my job does not have anything to do with electronic engineering. Maybe the odd troubleshooting of cables, but that's about it. What you really need in this job is knowledge of computers. Hardware, not so much, but software, yes. You need to be above average when it comes to computers. You need to be able to learn new software easily. In this job, new software will be thrown at you like no man's business. Sometimes you go home and you come back and you're faced with a very completely new software. Sometimes your old software is updated so much that it feels like a new software. So you need to be able to learn it quickly and start using it in your job. You need to know Linux at least the basic commands of Linux and how to move around in the Linux file system. Linux is not like Windows where you click icons. Most things are done at the command prompt in Linux. It's uh, like DOS. You also need to know Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel. Like You need to have advanced proficiency in these two. We use them daily for our logs and uh, reports and you don't want to be learning Microsoft Word when you should be writing your report and you don't want to be learning Microsoft Excel when your boss tells you to prepare a log quickly that will track this time, track that time, track this, track that and you need knowledge of Excel functions, you know, the formula in Excel to be able to do that. You don't need to know all the formula but at least you need to be able to plug in a formula that you got off Google and produce that magical log. 
as you rise in the company, you will need to have good knowledge of Microsoft PowerPoint because you may be required to make presentations. Most companies will not test you for these soft skills before they hire you, but for you to be able to do your job very well without frustrations, you need these skills. These are life skills which you can learn on the internet. Yeah, go get them before you apply for the job because they will help you out. What training do you need for this job? All the training you need for this job will be given to you by the company that hires you. There are technical and non-technical trainings. First, the non-technical trainings. You must pass Bosiet and Hughes for you to work offshore. Bosiet is basic offshore survival course. It's basically how to stay alive and injury free offshore in case of an emergency. While Hewitt is how to escape from a helicopter in case it ditches while flying over water. You know, we fly to and from the vessels with the helicopters. You need to be able to escape from helicopters in case it ditches while flying, in case it overturns while in water. I can tell you now that you don't need to be a swimmer for you to pass these courses. But you do need to be comfortable in water. If you are afraid of water, it will be difficult for you. If your fear of water is so great, then maybe this job is not for you because you will come in close proximity with water at all times or at most times. When you are hired, these are the first two courses that you are sent to. If you don't pass any of them, you go home from the end of employment. I'll put the link to the Bossiet and Hewitt videos in the description box below. Even if you're not interested in working in the oil industry, those videos are fun to watch. Another one, you must pass the offshore medical. These are physical and medical exams that prove that you are fit to work offshore. And again, if you fail the exam, End of story. Anybody that works offshore must pass these three before they can work offshore. Then for the technical courses, your line manager will, when you're first hired, your line manager will know the courses that you need and book you for them. But with time and experience, you will know the courses that you need and bring them to the attention of your line manager who will then approve the courses and you can attend them. What's your job title? It depends on the company you work for. They give you different titles depending on your role. There are so many roles offshore. You can be called a seismic engineer, a seismic specialist, positioning engineer, navigator, observer, geophysicist, data processor, gun mechanic, compressor mechanic. These are the entry level job titles and you move up from there. I'll put the details of what each person does in the description box below. How old is too old to get into this job? It is better to start in your 20s just after university or whatever institution you went to. This job requires a lot of physical energy sometimes, so it's better to start while you're still young and full of energy. You will also be probably still single at that time, so you can travel to anywhere without missing anybody or without anybody missing you. In your 30s, it's still okay, but in your 40s, you should be thinking about leaving this job, not going into it. Are you the only woman in the crew? Does that bother you? Yes, I was the only female in that crew. At any point in time, there are about 50 to 60 people on board the vessel. And it is quite common to have only one female on board. Sometimes there will be two of us. No, it doesn't bother me. I'm used to being in the minority gender-wise. At uni, there were only a few of us, a few females in the whole faculty of engineering. During my youth service, I was the only female in a team of engineers. And... Uh, in this job, I've done it for a long time that I should be getting used to the lads by now. <laughs> How often do you work? Typical work schedules in the industry is five weeks on, that's five weeks on the vessel, five weeks off, that's five weeks at home. So you get a total of six months off every year. Not consecutive, but yeah, six months off. During your time off, you may be required to go for trainings, as you get more important in the job, you may be required to go to the office for meetings once a year. In spite of all the time off, you get paid every month. This is because offshore we work 12 hours a day, 7 days a week, 
that's already 84 hours more than double the 40 hour week that you get for people that work in offices these days i work as a freelancer that means i work when i want for which company i want and where i want the way it works is my agent gets job requests from companies and they contact me if it's a job i want i'll say yes and they arrange my flights if i'm not available i'll say no sometimes i say I won't be available from so 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 date to so 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 date so they don't even bother to contact me and uh, yeah I'm getting ready to retire from the industry and uh, I'm slowing down the number of times I work in a year I want to spend more time at home and uh, yeah so far this year I've only worked twice and I think that's it for me for the year <laughs> but if you work directly with a company you must keep to the five on five off schedule unless you have a real emergency, family emergency, of course. Seasickness. This wasn't really a question, but a good number of people expressed concerns about being seasick while offshore. While some people never get seasick, most people will be seasick the first time they go offshore. Yeah, the slight movements of the vessel will make you seasick, but with time, you'll get used to it. Then you have the odd rough seas from time to time, maybe for one or two days, you get five meters, 10 meters, and it comes down again. Yeah, on those occasions, if you're sick, you can take seasick pills. <laughs> uh, you'll be fine, and then the weather will come down again. Usually, we don't really work in really rough weather because that will be bad for the data that we acquire anyway. So you get bad weather from time to time, and it's fine. It's one of the hazards of the working in the industry. <laughs> So don't let seasickness stop you. Go for this job if you want to. To summarize, this job is for you if you like traveling. Yes, it is exciting to visit different countries of the world. It is fun, especially in the first few years where you're visiting new places. This job is not for you if you are a career person. You see yourself as the CEO of some company sometime in the future. Even though all seismic companies have offices, but the opportunity to move from offshore where most of their operations are to the office and continue to rise from there and eventually become a CEO is rare. This job is for you if you like lots of time off in your job. Yes, your friends and family will be so jealous of all the time off you get. Some of them will even begin to question if you have a real job. This job is not for you if you want to be home for every single special occasion. Christmas, birthdays, weddings. While your friends may be kind enough to fix their weddings when you will be at home, it is not guaranteed that you will be home at that time because you may be transferred to another vessel. You always offshore when your crew should be offshore and you're at home when your crew should be at home. So you actually what happens is at the beginning of the year, we get a schedule for the rotation and then we plan our family life around when we will be at home and pray that no changes will be made to those. In this job, unless you're freelancing, you will be offshore when it's your crew's turn to be offshore at Christmas and when it's your wife's birthday or something like that. This job is for you if you hate the cubicle environment of offices. This job is not for you if you like to dress up, look sharp on a Monday morning in your silk suit as you go to work. We work in a very informal environment, absolute dress down. We wear shorts, our old clothes, pyjamas and uh, come to work. I actually never wear makeup when I'm offshore. <laughs> this job is for you if you hate the early morning commute to work. We have the shortest commute here. We just wake up, go and have breakfast or lunch or dinner, depending on which meal you woke up to. Then take a few steps to work. It's like working from home. I love it. This job is for you if you hate boring routine, where you know exactly what to expect in the office the next day. In this job, you may go off shift with everything working very well, working according to plan, and then you wake up the next morning with everyone running helter-skelter because the worst has happened. <laughs> 
this job is for you if you get along with people easily. We may have 50 to 60 people on board, but you only get to work with a handful of people. So if you get pissed off easily with people, you hate this, you hate that, it's all about you, you will not exist offshore. <laughs> you can't exist offshore. Those five weeks offshore will feel like one year to you. So stay away from this job if you get pissed off with people easily. That's it. I hope I've answered all your questions about the job. If I missed yours, please bring it to my attention in the comments and I'll reply immediately. Good luck as you begin your career in oil exploration or as you change your career to oil exploration. See you soon and maybe one day I'll get to work with one of you. Bye.